Lily Taylor, welcome to An Actor Despairs. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing all right. You know, you are one of my all-time favorite actresses. I, you know, grew up in the 90s. 1990 was my birth year. And so many of the films I watched, like going back to those kind of quirky 90 movies that wouldn't really get made today, like something like, I don't know, Pecker or Ransom. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to say it here. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think one of the biggest things that pisses me off is that Six Feet Under, I think, is better than The Sopranos. You know, it's mm -hmm. The Wire, and I don't feel like that show ever gets the credit it deserves, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. it was right along the same time as those others. And, and you were so amazing on that. And I'm loving you uh, every Sunday. I'm Perry Mason right now. But yeah, I, I'm just, I'm such a big fan. And, you know, I, I talk on the podcast all the time, what separates, you know, the good actors who just make it a living playing their personality and the great actors who make distinct character choices that no other actor in the world could play. And you're one of them. And it's, mm. It just, it, you inspire me to work, you know? Mm, mm. Thank you. Thank you. It's so my pleasure. My so pleasure, truly. Yeah. Well, where did you grow up? Outside Chicago. And Pretty good that? place to grow up. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's like the Midwest, there's a lot of good actors that come out of there. Just like Australia, I think there's this um, kind of groundedness, you know, this like not getting too sentimental, not getting too overdramatic, just trying to get to the truth, get to the basic thing and, and tell the truth. Yeah. Um, so it was a great place to grow up. I grew up, I mean, I grew up with Steppenwolf as my elders. And then I grew up with, um, you know, Joyce Piven, who taught me, Jeremy Piven's mother, taught uh, John Cusack, uh, a bunch of, bunch of Joan Cusack. And it was, it was like joy. It was teaching acting through joy, through wow. games, really through theater games. So that's how I kind of entered in. I mean, I knew I wanted to be an actor from when I really, when, you know, when little kids, when we, we sort of, they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I don't know how I knew, but I said actor. I didn't say fireman. I didn't say doctor. I said actor. And I don't know, I don't know why I said that at four, which means to me that it, it does feel like a deeper thing for me and something that, you know, cause thespian means inspired by the gods. Yeah. And I know we were talking earlier and you said you didn't believe in God. I'm probably agnostic too, but I like the origin of that, of thespian because what I think, what I love the idea about this podcast is, is that you're finding meaning, you know, you're going deeper Yeah. and I think the thing with acting is it's, it's deep because we're telling stories and that's, that's kind of how we started becoming human yeah. was by telling stories to each other. I mean, and that's the critical part of mankind. It was like shared knowledge was how we figured out, you know, to, to move forward in the next generation. Exactly. And yeah. I think that we are still evolving emotionally and, I feel it's, it's, a, it's my responsibility as an actor to convey the truth of the human experience because my, my conveying of that truth is going to register on a deeper level with the human being who's taking it in and it's going to help them reflect on their feelings, process their feelings. But, you know, if, we, if we're general as actors or don't convey a truth, um, we're not doing other human beings a service because yeah. we're still evolving emotionally. As you can see, look where we are emotionally as a, as a nation right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious then. So did your parents, uh, did they integrate you into children's theater when you were young? No, it all came from me. Like it was like, I was one of those who was like, uh, you know, um, well, you know, I've, I put myself into acting camp when I was in eighth grade because I'd done a voiceover and I had a little bit of cash. I found out where that was. I found out about the acting school. You know, I had that desire. Um, you don't have to have that. You don't have to have that. You can, you can come to acting at any time. It's, it's not a good or bad thing, but that was my deal. And when you circle back to that desire of Young Lily, was that, was that a theater or was that film TV or just acting? theater. I had this weird idea that I didn't, I was snobby at a young age and I don't even know why or how, but I, I thought I only wanted to do theater. And that was the only thing that mattered. And I also thought I couldn't become professional until I had training. Yeah. 
and I got kicked out of school, so that the uh, conservatory, so that that whole kind of idea planned and pan out the way I was I thought it would. So talk to me in in high school. Did you have a good experience with like your drama teacher doing school plays, or did that not really? be the time for you to kind of grow your seeds and plant them as an actress? I had a fantastic drama teacher. And in fact, I did like uh, the effect of gamma rays on Man in the Moon Made Marigolds. Yeah. I don't know if you know that Paul Zendel play. I mean, he directed me in it when I was a sophomore in high school. And he was so good that he, that, that in our school was really good acting program that sometimes Chicago, if there was a movie that came into town, they, they would ask for our high school students if it was a younger part. And so I went down, I went into the city when I was a senior to audition. And it was like, I went to the, you know, wrong place, which was the agency instead of the, instead of the cattle call. And then, you know, the agents were mad at me for going to the wrong place. And then, but then the director saw me and was like, well, why doesn't, you know, why doesn't she just come in and read? Yeah. Uh, so that was that. And, and then I almost got that and I got something else. And then, and they reluctantly signed me on. And then, um, and then I got a play my senior year of high school. And then I started, and then I got into a conservatory, Goodman of DePaul. And I was like, okay, so I, I will not emerge until it, I get my training. Adjacent with the Goodman Theater? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that was one of those, you know, league schools. I almost didn't get in because my voice wasn't trainable, but I fought my way in. And then I told my agents, you cannot call me for four years because you can't work professionally here. Wow. Well, yeah, so they called me. There was a one day where I would have missed one day of school. Um, the one, you know, everyone said okay. It would have paid for my third quarter, and except for one teacher said no. We got into an argument, and uh, he said, "You know, we don't like your attitude." I said, "I don't like your attitude," and he said, "Don't come back. I don't want to come back." Boom, and that was over. And so that's, wow. and so that's not how I wanted to enter into acting. It was really hard because I thought I couldn't. I thought I needed all these, um, I thought I needed training. Credentials before. and all that, yeah. Well, not even credentials. Like, it was weirder than that. Like, it was kind of more fucked up because I thought I needed this badge of, like, this sort of stamp. Yeah. Like, she's passed the test. Yeah. And really what was happening for me, it was kind of breaking my spirit a little bit. And I don't think that was the right thing for me being in that school. You know, so and at, at, during that like post breakup period, did you feel that then, or did it take a long time for you to see? Oh, that? oh, I was severely depressed because my roommates were going off to college. They were like, they were like in the club, you know, and I yeah. was on the outside, you know, and I was like, I went into a depression, and um, and then you know, and then I started to get work, and I was like, oh well, I guess my path is I'm figuring out while well, I'm doing it. Yeah. You know, little did I know that's really like a great way to learn is by yeah. doing. <laughs> totally. How, yeah. how, if you don't mind me asking, how did you not cave to despair? Because you had agents and you had auditions. Oh, no, oh. I caved. To, I still caved to despair. <laughs> me no, <too>. no. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's the thing is it's not about the it's an inside job. It doesn't yeah. matter what what happens externally. I still cave. The, the, one of the problems is our our business you see that's one of the problems we, it's a business and it's really it's an art form but it, it's a business yeah it's so it so sets us up for compare and despair oh you know God. it so sets right it, it, it's so like winners and losers yeah uh you know and and it's so not the right equation because there is nobody like you there is yeah. nobody like me yeah and if x gets that part and you don't um i'm saying this but even though I, yesterday i i was like devastated because you know someone got something that I didn't but yeah. here I can talk today in, in a reasoned tone totally about you know um I mean look I'm I'm 53 so I've I've had a, a lot of experience that's sort of becoming wisdom in a way yeah which is um I kind of, a, of a, am understanding that it's really not personal it's not personal it really feels it. It feels like X has something that you don't. And like, if only you could have what X has, then maybe you'd be getting the, the work. Yeah. But it's really, it's, it's deeper than that. There's so many things to learn. There's so many things to reflect back on and think about and turn it into kind of um, a meaningful experience as opposed to a black or white, good or bad, yeah. fail, loop, fail or succeed. 
Beautiful. And then how did you get back on the horse, so to speak? Did you think about going to college? Did you look at other conservatories or? Oh, God, no. No, I wouldn't go through that again. I mean, I barely got into that one. They said my voice wasn't trainable. So I've always had a hang up with my voice. Yeah. Um, So you know what it is? It's sort of like, I guess, make a decision, make a decision. And, and what price are you willing to pay? to, 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 to honor that decision. And I had made the decision that I will go to any lengths that I need to, to, um, act. Mm. And so that means being willing to pay some of the prices that come with it. Um, and some of those prices are, are not what you'd think. Like some, one of the prices I found was saying no, when people were telling me to say yes. Yeah. Right, because um, I know that might seem like a luxury problem, but sometimes we we um, are given something or have an opportunity for something that might not feel right to us. Yeah, and yet agents are saying, "Well, if you, if you don't take this, it's as if it's never. No, there's no other job that's going to come again. Yeah, that's the last job you could, you're going to ever get. It's the job that's going to make A, B, C, and D plans work out. Yeah. By the way, that's never worked out for me. Whenever, it's, like, okay, yeah. these what? It's not mathematical. Yeah. It doesn't make A plus C plus B doesn't equal, you know, success. It, it really doesn't. It, it, no. It's, no, there's no rules. It's, yeah. And it, who knows how all that works? Who knows? I don't think we could figure it out. But so when I would say no, and, and it, it could feel very lonely, you know, at like, you know, like no one was like uh, sending me flowers on the little independent that I chose over, over the studio film. Yeah. That, seemed like a be- like a more better career choice but would have maybe not made me as happy you know were you in that chicago clique with like Hughesack, joan yeah. jeremy um yeah. dv steve yeah, yeah. spoony so you guys all knew yeah. each other yeah yeah we were we were like we were yeah we were yeah we were a gang and this is right as steppenwolf was was starting to become a thing right no they were already a thing they were um, okay oh yeah they were already a thing um, that the shepherd had already been, you know, shepherd was still sort of new, but he had already been around probably five or 10 years wow. at that point, maybe, maybe, maybe five years, but it felt like he was already around. Like I was doing his monologues, you know? Well, when you did like, for example, one of my favorite movies of all time, high fidelity, would you consider that a studio movie or an indie? Well, okay. I consider that independent because Frears had authority he had autonomy yeah that's kind of my definition like in the 90s independent was a whole different thing and but even what I think it really means is does the director have autonomy and you can have autonomy with 20 million dollars it's just harder because yeah. those people want to make that money back I understand that I wouldn't want to put 20 million up and like you know not make it back yeah um but uh so it's about autonomy, I think, as opposed to, um, you know, I mean, you could have a director who is technically an independent director, but isn't really making a film that's true to them. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're making a film that pe- they think people want to see and it's bullshit. And, and uh, in the late 90s, you know, when you, when you were doing all these films, I'm curious, like, what was attracting you to them? Was it Was it a paycheck? Was it was it a good script? Was it an indie? One for you, one for them? Was it an amalgamation of all the things? I think directing, the director is usually what is the most important thing for me. Because even if the part is really good, it, it doesn't really matter if the whole thing isn't going to work or if the yeah. director isn't going to take it. Because I could do that in an acting class or something. Yeah. I, could, I could like, you know, uh, have a heyday in an acting class. I don't have to like do something just for me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's just not really worth it. It's just, I don't know. I, so I, I, the vision is what I want to be in the collaboration yeah. because at the end of the day, there's so little things we have control over, but we do have some say in the collaboration. And at the end of the day, that's what really, really makes me happy. And, yeah. it, and, and when I, when I'm, you know, done or almost done, I'll, I'll know that I had a lot of great relationship working relationships and and even if that movie never came out or it sucked or or um whatever it was a really great experience that's so beautiful and i'm i'm curious then 
how long did you stay in Chicago for before doing like an LA or a New York move? Well, I, I knew I always wanted to come to New York, but I got in a fight with equity in Chicago because they're very, they were very strict there union wise. And, um, I was going to do a play with Cusack and those guys. And, um, they told me that they would, they would come, they would find out if I was doing that because I had my equity card because I got it really early by accident. And when I was a senior in high school and they were like, we will take your card away forever. And we will find out if you're doing that play. So I was like, fuck you. And so I happened to go to New York and- Why? Because it was a non-equity production? Yeah, it was non oh. Because there was 120 non-equity houses and all the good theater there was non-equity. Yeah. There yeah. were only 14 equity houses. And it's not like the, the most interesting place was Steppenwolf. And it's not like a part for a, a high school person came along all the time. Like, yeah. you know, uh, Grapes of Wrath. I almost got that. But yeah. that's like- you know, when does that don't, doesn't come along every, you know, so I was like, I went to New York to visit my sister. I auditioned for something there because I'd already had a couple movies and an agent. And, um, and it was exactly what I'd hoped. I had a little money in my pocket. I, I got this avant-garde play at the public theater who could ask oh. for anything more for me, at least. Amazing. Um, it was, a, it was a really lovely way to come into New York. I was yeah. really, very, gr very grateful for that. What piece was it? Richard Foreman, it was called What Did He See? It was at the Public Theater in uh, 88. So that's, wow. and that's always how I wanted to go to New York to do, yeah. I knew New York was hard, you know, and I knew I wanted to go with a little bit of money and, and with a play. And that's exactly, and that's how it happened. And that's fantastic. Amazing. And, and at this point, were you still with your Chicago agency or did you switch? I what? I, no, I had, I think I switched at this point Got because it. they didn't have a New York office. But, you know, to, it's funny. I would almost say to actors, because sometimes actors say, you know, for, you know, what, where should they go? What should they do? And yeah. I almost think if, if it's possible to stay in a smaller city, and I don't know how possible that is today. I don't know what the landscape is like out there, especially now because everything's changing so fast. I don't yeah. know. But because I think almost like, I think the problem, I think LA, I would say New York over LA. Um, because sure. I think that, you know, I, I think it's, I think if you're not doing something that's meaningful, it's very hard. Yeah. And LA, it can feel really like just going after audition after audition, not getting anything. It all sucks. And it's you're like. A needle in a stack of needles. It, 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 exactly. Yeah. And it can get really existential. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, and, and New York, I feel like. Uh, I don't know. I've always just, I've always felt like it was a little bit easier in New York for me than LA spiritually, yeah. like just like keeping my head above water kind of thing. Or like, I would say if, if, if you can go to a, a smaller city that has an agency where things can come through, where you can do some theater, where the price of living's not as high, you know, those things will give you, um, you know, that, that something that'll keep remind you why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, totally. Beautifully put. And that's amazing. And then, so as you were working your way, were you, uh, you know, in the, in the early 90s and to mid, late 90s, you know, television started becoming a thing. What, were, were you starting to do a lot more of that? Because before it was just broadcast. You know, like in the late 90s is when we started to get HBO and other kind of unique forms of, of darker content. Okay, well, here's what's so interesting is I remember at that moment, I was doing a play, The Three Sisters, and Fli Callista Flockhart was in the play, and everyone was in that a play. A classic crazy. stage company? <laughs> no, this uh. one was actually on Broadway. It was at Roundabout. But oh, the best. Ev everybody was in this play. It was so crazy. And um, so Callista got Allie McBeal. And we were, she went off, and she, of course, we were like, you have to go do it. But we were all making fun of her because at that time, doing TV was not good. Yeah. If you did TV at that time, your, your, your career was over. It was yes. like you were a TV person. We were like making, you know, making fun of her. She's like, stop, you know, and we'd all go out for a drink because she was like two more weeks before she had to leave. And we were just fucking with her every night. And, and of course, that show was a kind of a change of how and networks were shifting. That and then HBO. And, and Arliss, right? Ali McBeal and Arliss were like, the two. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, the two yeah. like network. And then I remember uh, Mike Imperial, I, Mike Imperial and I had gone out and uh, we were going out for years in the early nineties and, and, but you know, we would, we'd broken up, but I'd heard he got the Sopranos and I thought, Oh, poor Mike. 
you know, Mike is going to, Mike's doing TV, yeah. you know, it's, oh, it's, he must've hit hard times, you know, I had no idea what was, what was about to happen with T, with HBO. And then of course I followed suit on the next show with, with yeah. Six Feet Under, which, which was like, um, you know, I was like, that's when I realized like it, it doesn't, the vehicle doesn't matter. Like how you're watching the, the actor doesn't matter if it's on what platform um, great stuff can be on a little box. Yeah. It can be on, it can be on a little screen on a big screen. And, and that's when I, I got over my like snobbery over TV, like as, as, as HBO has changed at all. It's, it's totally. not TV. It's and, HBO. And forgive me. Cause I don't want to go on IMDb and do this, but was, was, uh, American beauty before six feet under. I believe it was. Wow. I so believe you, it was. So talk to me when, when that script came your way, did you know Alan Ball, you know? Well, yeah, I still actually didn't, I didn't really want to commit to a TV show because I still didn't love the five year thing. Yeah. Um, and I lived in New York, it was shooting in LA. I didn't want to move. So they just said, look, well, how about you just do like five episodes? I said, that sounds great. I love that. But then the, the character got pregnant. So I was like, yeah. oh, I guess I, that means I'm, I, oh, I see. So, um, horrible but I didn't suicide to... scene. Oh God. <laughs> oh God. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, but commuting. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Spoiler I know. alert! Spoiler alert! <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, if if you haven't seen it yet, I'm sure you all know yeah. what happens in that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, if they haven't seen it yet, you're listening to the wrong podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But talk to me more. So. So I commuted. Saying? I okay. commuted. Um. And 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 commuting works. I mean, that's another way to make things work. You know. What talk to me? What 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 made it imperative to you to stay in New York? I mean, I know we talked about the LA thing before, but was it because of theater? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to this day, theater, I know you and Chloe did something in 2014, but you know, is it still something every year? You know, you talk to your yeah. Team? That's great. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's theater, it's the subway, it's, it's, it, there's something about the, the immediacy there that, that helps me yeah. um, stay um, connected to myself and to others. And, and as it was airing, talk to me, you know, back before social media, what was it like being on a show, you know, because now like, you know, Game of Thrones or something, they do the review and everyone talks about it. But back then it was like it aired. And I think if you missed it, you had to, like, TiVo was maybe a thing in, like, 2000. No, it, wa it, wasn't, it wasn't even, no. Wow. No. Yeah, so, exactly. Truly appointment TV. Like, truly, we didn't even know it was called appointment TV because there wasn't something you didn't have to make an appointment for yet, you know? Wow. Um, but, yeah, it was like everyone gathered. It was an event. You know, we had an event. It was Sunday night. Um, you had to wait all week. There was anticipation. Um, it was exciting. It was yeah. um yeah, it was really exciting. Yeah. And so many great actors on that show. I, I know. Mean, oh, man. Freddie Rodriguez. Some, I, uh, Michael. Uh, Seahall. Seahall. Yeah. God, love him. And then the guy who plays your lover. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's just been crushing the game for so long. So then when you, when you get done, you did, I know it was spaced out, but it was like four seasons you did on that show? I think so, yeah. So then when yeah. you get, when you get out of that, where's your head at? Do you, you're like, I need a break from TV. I want to do some movies or I want to do a play. Like where was Lily's head? <laughs> oh, I, I did a play. I did a play. Yeah, Amazing. I did. Um, yeah, I did a play. And, um, and it was a really important experience for me. Um, and, and then I was back in New York and yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah it's just like, it's just about keep, keep on keeping on. You yeah. know, just keep going, keep going, keep going. I, I know we touched on, you know, it was a specific time and people could miss it, but did it open a lot of doors for you? Like did casting directors who didn't know you or, you know, directors start calling you because no. they loved you? Really? No, I don't know. No, no. Wow. No. That's so strange. You're amazing on that show. It's like a... Thank you. Literally a Titanic of a performance, you know? It's so Thank good. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. And then, um, I uh, yeah. I after that, then what, what did you want to do? You know, after that play. After the play, um, gosh, I guess that was my thirties. Like, 
I felt like the business was changing a lot. I felt like, I feel like in, that's when independence started to really change. And so it was about um, kind of adapt, learning how to adapt. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, there was different, it wasn't as just like, you couldn't just like get some, raise some money with a friend and make a movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so your friends like had lists. Now they had to, you know, look at for actors and, you know, it was just like um, a little different. So I spent a lot of time adapting, you know, like figuring out what to do. Like if something's not working, what do I need to do here? You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then did you start kind of getting in some indie roles you know, with, with friends as, as the indie circuit started to rise or did you still, you know, because you have to, you have to make money to survive. Were you going back to TV or, you know, movies? God, good question. It's like, I felt like I, I kept working, but in some ways it's, it's a little bit um, abstract to me that time. No, no, not abstract. It's or disjointed or, and I think cause some of it was, I think I was like, felt in a, I felt like in a slump a bit. Like I felt like I wasn't trusting myself. And and in retrospect it was an important experience, you know, because you know, we're going to ebb and flow. There's no, we have to allow ourselves to ebb and flow. Yeah. And just like, you know, like I love sports because sports is so concrete. And so like when you see that pitcher in in a slump, you know, and for you can kind of there's things you can apply to such an amorphous thing that we do, which is yeah. acting, right? So, like I I was I was thinking a lot about sports, like in the third in my thirties, you know, because like what what was going on for me? Like I wasn't trusting myself. Why? What was what was happening with with my instincts? What was happening with the execution of those instincts? What was how how could I get out of my head? Yeah. You know. Um, just so many great questions that were so hard to answer, but I know they, they're great because now I'm older and, and I passed through it. Yeah. You know, but I wouldn't have learned about like, I wasn't listening in a way because I was in fear. I, I thought I needed to do something besides be who I am because I felt like who I was, wasn't going to get me work. Yeah. So how can I be something different than me? Cause somehow I'm, broken or something's wrong with me. Yeah. So if I become, if I do, if I just don't do me, maybe it'll work, but you have to do you because if you don't do you, you're, you're, you're a mess. I you're know. nothing. Yeah. And how did you stay anchored during that time? Well, um, through, through just going me- through just the mentally. feelings. Yeah. Mentally, like, well, you have to learning how to tolerate suffering. It's like, to learn how to suffer, you know, yeah. and to s- sit through something and get through it. And you just, you, you get your feet on the ground and you get your energy. You, you just fucking say, I'm going to stay here today. I'm going to stay another day here yeah. on this, on this planet, you know, and, and just like get it manageable. Like, okay, just, just worry about today, you yeah. know, we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And just like get through each day. And just just get through it, and and a day at a time we can, because that's about all that's manageable for me at least. A hundred percent. At any time, did all of a sudden, you know, things start to switch for you, and you're like, maybe LA would be, you know, I don't know, nice with palm trees or no? Did that not? Happen? Yeah, it did. It did. Because I also yeah. thought clearly there's a different formula. You know, clearly like. Um, it, it maybe I shouldn't have said no to all those commercial movies. First of all, yeah. maybe I shouldn't have. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I thought. Um, well, you went with your um, heart, and I, I, that's what artists do, and I, I love and respect you so much for that. You know, it's like in some ways, some of those words wouldn't have come out of my mouth anyway. That's just for me. I don't judge. Anybody. I wouldn't judge anybody for doing anything. But for me, some of those lines, especially for a woman, we have a lot more lines that are bad than men. I think. Yeah. Um, the few lines we have, we don't have as many lines, first of all. And the few that we do have, because we have about a quarter as many as men. And the few that we have suck. And so it's like, I couldn't say like, oh, um, you know, some stupid ass, you know, line because the person that created this character is, she's a one dimensional woman. You know, a lot of the women were just like, I couldn't, I'm like, I'm sorry. She's just, she's like a, an idea. She's an idea. I don't, I don't want to keep, 
I don't want to put a woman like this out there because she's, that's not helpful to a man or a woman. Going off that, you know, I'm very curious because, you, you know, you've worked for so long and now we're at a place where, you know, we get, you know, strong woman, female characters, you know, what I imagine, you know, maybe in the, the 90s, there were some pretty insulting scripts that might have come your way, you know? How- well, there still are. Yeah. No, there- it's still bad. Oh no, yeah. it's bad. It it seems it's it seems better. Just like you know, before Black Lives Matter, yeah, there's there's some progress. There's some. Oh no, there isn't. Oh no, there isn't. Yeah. And I would say the same is true. If you look at the stats, they're not good. You know, if you know the USC puts out a fantastic study each year, a a, a factual breakdown of really what the situation is of 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 how many parts there are, how many, how many minutes a woman talks compared to a man, how many females are behind the camera, blah, blah, blah. It's not good. It's not good. And yeah. so we need to, we need to, you know, it's, there's some things that are getting through more like Valerie Solanas, I shed into Warhol. Okay. Would never, that would never have gotten through into the mainstream in yeah. the nineties. Yeah. That would maybe get through now. That's a shift. Like the membrane is maybe thinner for like things to get through. But, um, but that, that doesn't mean a lot more is coming through. There's, there's gotta be more generated for it to all come through. You know, yeah. the time is right. Maybe, maybe windows are opening, but not windows of opportunity, just windows to get content through. Fascinating. And, and as an artist and as a straight white man, what, what can listeners and anyone do to, to ensure that we really do get this authentically, you know, not just, you know, some kind of cliche, like, oh, she carries a gun and kills the bad guy. You know, she's three dimensional, you know, and I imagine you know, that happens a lot. It, it has. It, I yeah. mean, to me, yeah. to me, I mean, it's, it's bias. It's like, it's, it's, it's unconscious bias. And I think, and that's what we're seeing with a lot of the black lives. Or no, that's what I'm seeing with the black lives matter stuff is, yeah. is a lot of it's unconscious bias. And it's one of the hardest things to deal with. One of any, Nothing they have found um, has stuck to work with like cops, you know, cops and their unconscious bias, like any of the training things. When they do follow up studies, nothing held. It's one of the hardest things to do because it's unconscious. But I would say is to admit that we all have unconscious bias. Yeah. And if you're a guy and you're writing a part and you're, there's a woman, maybe just to know, maybe she's not that different than you. Maybe just write as if you were writing something for you, but it happens to be a woman. Totally. Let's see what happens. I love that. That's great. It's beautiful. And then I'm curious, you know, cause I don't want to take up too much of your time, but like, uh, talk to me now about, you know, Perry Mason, you know, that I, I'm, I'm a huge Tim Van Patten fan and you're amazing on that show. You know, like what's it like to be a part of, of that world? I love that you're a Tim Van Patten fan. He is such a beautiful man. I cannot say enough about him. He's somebody that everybody should just study and like yeah. shadow. In fact, I I'm going to ask him more. if I can sh- He is, he's just a, a soul, you know, a soul to learn from. I'm going to ask him if I can shadow him next season. Um, Cause I, I don't think obviously my, whatever. I mean, they'll go on to a new case. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, so I'm, my case is, they're done with my case, I'm sure. So, um, I'm going to just ask him if I can just follow him around and learn. Yeah, you should. You know, he is so great. Um, So Perry Mason was fantastic. And a lot of it was because of Tim um, and Matthew, but it it really comes from the top. And Tim set up an atmosphere of love and kindness and uh, generosity and care and truth. Matthew's lovely. Matthew carried on that, you know, he, you know, it was his show and he's just absolutely lovely. I think the thing with HBO, which they've always shown is they always care. They care about the actors. They yeah. care about acting. My brother, and Shane Wiggum, have- you know, and uh, you, you, you guys are like HBO family, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. That's your brother. No, no, no. Like one of my best friends. I say brother. Oh, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> my soul brother. <laughs> okay. I was like, whoa, okay, back up. Let's let okay. That'd be really yeah. funny if I changed my name from like Perret from Wiggum to no, Perret. I, I looked, I looked on the I looked, I was like, but he, his name's Perez. And, no. Um, 
I, I, just, be- I just got off the phone with him before this interview. So I was like, yeah, you know, we always, yeah. yeah. Bro, talk. He's your bro. He's your bro, man. He's my bro, he's my bro. He's bro, yeah. we need we need our we need our bros. Um, yeah. um, it, it was fucking great. It was a great experience. I loved it. I just loved it. Um, because it had that thing that I was talking about at the beginning. It had everything that I would hope for, which is collaboration. I love the crew. I love collaborating with the crew. I love collaborating with props, script, yeah. production design, costumes. I love, I love uh, the whole thing, working with other people, you know? And on that scale too, you know, period pieces are, it's my dream to do one of those, you know? It's, oh yeah? Yeah. The, the amount of authenticity that goes into the props and the location scouting and it's crazy. Oh, I hope one comes your way, especially for HBO because man, they bringing out when I went into that prop truck to like, like what kind of notebook can I choose? Or what, yeah. what pens do I, what pens can I choose? You know, and the, the prop woman knew how much I was into it. And so she was just like, she had, we had a blast. Uh, I hope, I hope you get to do one. It's really fun. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope we get to work one day together. It'd be a dream come true. But uh, mm. I, uh, I don't want you to give any spoilers away. Cause I don't want to get, no, I won't. Home, but no. you, your, your last episode season or uh, one episode four it was a really heavy episode for your character. Can you talk about a little bit what's in store for the rest of the season? Well, or is that going to give everything away? Well, I, I can talk a teeny, teeny, teeny bit about it. And just that I felt episode four was really great because I feel like the tension oh, is yeah. just building and it's sort of like, what is going on? I just saw Chinatown last night. And it has so many of the same feelings as Chinatown. Just like, what's going on? Yeah. What is underneath? I don't even know if I want to know yeah. what is underneath this dark world, you know, this yeah. Chinatown, you know? Totally. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to get more intense. I mean, it's, there's a lot more to... Perry Mason is starting to... It's tip of the iceberg at four. Yeah. Let's put it yeah. that way, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and Tatiana, how is it working with her? Lovely. I mean, yeah. that's... I mean, yeah. I mean, she is she's a real worker i mean she yeah. fucking works you and know t- and talk about kind of like feminism i mean she goes out there and makes her statement spoiler alert and doesn't give a fuck what anyone you know what i mean like so badass it's, exactly exactly yeah. that's amazing and so talk to me you know what what else is interesting you right now you know i know we're in a really rough time and in, in not just Hollywood, I don't want to make it about us, but the world and there's so much pain and suffering, you know, what's keeping you inspired? Well, you know, I love at the beginning, you know, Tanahisi Kote said, um, or I've pronounced his last name is, um, you know, that he saw a lot of hope, you know, he said at the beginning of Black Lives Matter and, and I do too. And I think that, you know, there's nothing like a bottom, you know, um, to, because, you know, when you can't dig anymore, uh, yeah. you're going to probably start going back up. And I totally. think we're about, I think, well, I think Trump's like a fentanyl. I feel like if we were like, uh, yeah. if we were addicts, he's our fentanyl, you know? Yeah. And so he's, he's brought us so fast and down. I still think we can go further down, unfortunately, but I think that, um, November is, it is in sight. Yeah. And, um, I think something interesting is happening and I think virus is, actually the only thing that could bring that black hole down yeah. um, of Trump. And I think it's, I, I'm devastated that it took a pandemic to do it, but I think, I don't know if anything but a pandemic could have actually t- taken him, him down, down because yeah. he's, bizarre, he's a bizarre specimen of, of matter. You know, yeah. he's just, he's just a, he's, I don't think, I don't, if he got put into space, I don't think the universe would know what to do with him. No, space, you know, I don't even. I think, I think the might. black hole. I mean, I think a black hole would say, "Uh, uh-uh. uh." Yeah. You know, even I can't suck you up. But yeah. um, he's just that kind of awful thing. But um, November's in sight, and you know there was a great. Okay, I know it's keeping me inspired. Um, there was a great quote that I read. Have you heard about the um, the stack? I think it's stack pole syndrome. No, I have not. Okay, or no, maybe it's not a syndrome. Maybe it's, um, gosh, please. Uh, no, it's the Stackpole. Okay, he was a guy, a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And Stackhouse, shit. Um, he basically said he was a prisoner of war and he lived through it and a lot of the guys didn't. And he said, what kept you, what kept you going? And he said, I knew 
there was going to be an end of the story. But I was able, I, I kept looking at the brutal facts of reality while keeping sight on the end of the story, but not getting too specific. Like he said, the guys, he, then the guy said, well, who died? Who went? He said, oh, I'll tell you who went. The guys with hope. Yeah. And the guy said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, yeah, the guy who said, uh, yeah, Thanksgiving, I'm going to go home. Yeah. yeah uh, Christmas, I'm going to go home. And then New Year's comes, he's still not home. And then he dies of a broken heart. Whoa. And so it's like, I know I said at the beginning of this, November, it's all about November. And it is. It is about November. But the end of the, 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 end of the story is going to be that we're going to all be okay. Yeah. And we're going to get through this. The brutal facts are that we're, our democracy is in serious trouble. Yeah. We, I would not have known this. I would not have, I didn't know how much I loved my, our democracy. I'm a patriot yeah. and I did not know that. Yeah. I'm I really, did not have any I'm, idea. No. I'm a patriot. Yeah. I fucking want our democracy. I love it. I will do anything to make sure that we keep it intact. Whatever my job as a civilian, my civic duty to yeah. keep this democracy going. And if Trump gets elected, look, we're going into authoritarianism. That's it. Yeah. But that doesn't mean yeah. we won't stop building for the next generation. Cause yeah. I've got a kid. Yeah. She's 12. I, we've got to keep, we've got to pay. We've got to keep paving the way for the next generation. So we're not going to give up because we're not going to roll up and die, totally. but it's real. It's very real. But um, I'm, 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 this is interesting. So I have a lot of, I'm looking at the brutal facts, but I have hope in the, in the end of the big story. That's so beautiful. I really love how you put that. And thank you for your honesty. Are there, are there any other Lily projects coming out anytime soon that you can announce? I know it's so weird because of these, um, you know, I've got two movies that, I, you know, uh, Paper Spiders and Winter House, but like they were both going to go and sell it somewhere and now they're yeah. not. And I don't know what the hell now. Yeah. And then I'm going to zoom my, I'm going to workshop my, one one person show and zoom it and workshop let it. me know i'll be there okay yeah um yeah so that's 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 what's doing oh and then outer range i'm gonna do this amazon show in the fall oh and supposedly amazing. it's going yeah supposedly wow. it's going so that's that's amazing we'll see we'll see yeah. what happens yeah yeah well lily taylor thank you so much for coming on this was this is amazing and you're so awesome and i'm such a big fan and I can't wait to see your one woman show and let's grab a cup of coffee soon. I'd love to text when yeah. you come to New York someday. Yeah. I know you're I, not allowed yet. I live in Williamsburg. Wait. You do? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were in LA. No, no, no. I'm oh, here. doing the fantastic. Oh God. That's great. Here, I'm texting you. Uh, I'm doing the chat. My number right now. Oh, brilliant. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, uh, screenshot it or save it. Um, that I just put it to everyone. Okay, I am in. Um, I'm Oops. in. Um, I'm I, in upstate. Oh no, that doesn't work. I put if it I, I dial that, um, if if there I'm um, I'm upstate, but let's um, I'm I'm screenshotting it because chats don't save. I've at least that's oh, been yeah, my experience. Um, I'm I'm upstate. Um, because nice. that's where we came in March. But um, uh, so I'm heading back in like the fall when my. P Poughkeepsie hmm? upstate or further? P uh, Poughkeepsie-ish. Oh, okay. Like a half an hour past Poughkeepsie, but not okay. like, I'm, I'm the fake upstate. Got it. Um, Got it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so that'd be great, man. Yeah. I, live in, I live in Brooklyn. So yeah, I live in Brooklyn. Brooklyn into house. I'm at Lorimer's okay, man. stop, so we'll get up and we'll hang. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right, hon. Amazing. Well, text me, the, text me now so I have yours and so I can get that link when you do your one woman show. Okay, man. And all right. a final question for all the um, actors out there that are kind of really struggling in, in this pandemic and don't really know if there's a future of the business and are kind of lost and don't have rep. I know it's a really loaded question, but any advice to those actors listening? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, the director that I'm working with on the one woman show is young and she saw this experience as um, an opportunity. And she was already thinking outside the box. So I would say, find other people. Find other people, find some younger people. Um, and just start talking to other people. And 
I think that's one thing I have found. You know what? You know what? The last thing I want to say is when you said like, well, how'd you get through that time? How'd you get through that time? Because I've been through like a million hard times. Yeah. It's, it's really been through people that I've, I've, I've gotten through it. So find someone who can say me too, me too. And oh my God, you're not crazy. I'm not crazy. And just start talking and then maybe something will come out. Maybe not. Doesn't matter, but just, just find someone and talk to them. And I think that's probably why your podcast is doing so well because you're, 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 you're finding people and talking deeply. Yeah. Well, I think that the world needs a lot more of that right now, you know, and it does. I'm, so, I'm so grateful for you sharing and being so open and honest. And I'm such a big fan. And, and now hopefully we're going to be lifelong friends and, you, you know, it. I'm looking forward to, to hanging soon and I'm sending you so much love. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you. All right. All right. Ciao. I love you. Over and out. All love right. you. All right, man. Ciao. Bye.